Hello, my name is Roisin and welcome or welcome back to my channel. Since last month I read the Booker Prize shortlist, which I will leave in the cards above, and November is non-fiction November, I thought it might be fun for me to read the Bally Gifford Prize shortlist. Now, I am not a non-fiction connoisseur, I have not read a huge amount of non-fiction, and in fact this year I intended to read two non-fiction a month, and I think I've only read 14 non-fiction books so far this year, so if I do read this shortlist I will be greatly helping my goals. The reason I say that though, that I'm not a non-fiction expert, is that I am not entirely sure how to review non-fiction, and I feel like that's part of the reason I wanted to make this video. Forcing me to talk about a lot of non-fiction books might help me to understand a what I like in non-fiction and b how to talk about non-fiction to you. I've spent so much time these past year and a half talking to you about fiction that I feel like I've got a handle on how to do that, but non-fiction feels a little more tricky. The Bally Gifford Prize is a prize given every year for the best non-fiction, and because non-fiction is so broad there are a lot of different books on this shortlist, some that would have interested me anyway, others that I'm going to see how well I get on with them, but I would probably not have picked up on my own. So the first one I have here is Fall, The Mystery of Robert Maxwell by John Preston. And John Preston also wrote A Very English Scandal, which was made into a BBC uh, miniseries, which I haven't watched. This one is a different story, a different kind of scandalous story, I believe, um, and it's been shelved as biography. Um, so it's the story of Robert Maxwell. Now, Robert Maxwell died, I believe, in 1991, which is what this book is about. I was born in 1992 so I have absolutely no idea about this story. I know Ghislaine Maxwell because isn't she currently on trial for her involvement with Jeffrey Epstein um, but that's not what this story is about. This is about a uh, media mogul and former MP who made a triumphant entrance into Manhattan aboard his yacht to buy the New York Daily News. Just 10 months later, Maxwell disappeared from the same yacht off the Canary Islands, only to be found dead in the water afterwards. On his death, his empire fell apart, his long hidden debts and unscrupulous dealings came to light. Within a few days, Maxwell was reviled as the embodiment of greed and corruption. So, sounds like it's gonna be an interesting story, an interesting scandal. Um, so I am intrigued to read this one. Uh, and because, uh, a very English scandal did so well. I'm hoping that it will be quite uh, a fun read, quite an enjoyable one, um, and not too heavy on the detail. Then I also have Aftermath, The Life in the Fallout of the Third Reich, 1945 to 1955 by Harald Jana. Now this is obviously about Germany in 1945 to 1955 uh, and whilst I did study some German history at school we stopped in 1945 so interesting to see these 10 years after the defeat of the Nazis and the experience of Germany after being divided in two and um, having lost two world wars in quick succession. Uh, you may know if you're on this channel that European Second World War non-fiction, uh, historical fiction is not my genre. This is obviously non-fiction and slightly after the war um, uh, so we'll see how I get on with it. It seems like it's going to deal with a, a large cast of characters, which is something that I enjoy, obviously, real real people characters. So then the other four I don't have physical copies of yet, uh, <laughs> fingers crossed I will get some of them. Things I Have Withheld by Kay Miller. I enjoy Kay Miller as a poet, um, I'm not hugely familiar with them, but I do know some of their work and I have enjoyed that that I've read. And I also know that I enjoy fiction that is by poets, so I'm hoping that non-fiction by poet will also be something that I enjoy. And this is a collection of essays, which is another thing I've been meaning to read more of, and it's about the experience of discrimination through the silence in which so many things are kept, and what it means to breach it, to risk words, to risk truths. And he considers the histories our bodies inherit, the crimes that haunt them, and how meaning can shift as we move through the world, variously assuming privileges or victimhood. Uh, so this one, I think, sounds like the one that I would most likely have picked up without it being on this shortlist. Um, so I'm hoping that this will be one that I really enjoy. Empire of Pain by Patrick Radden Keith, and this is another one actually that I might have picked up if it weren't on this shortlist because I've heard people saying great things about it. So um, Hannah May, I know, has read this and really enjoyed it. And this is about the Sackler family. Um, they were a family that had their name on all sorts of museums and art galleries and universities, but nobody really knew where they got their wealth from. Um, but it, it turns out that they were the family that uh, developed and publicised 
oxycontin which is one of the drugs partly responsible for the opioid crisis in the united states so this is the story of that empire and of their dubious dealings and their relationships with the art world and kind of a, bio a biography of this family um as well as a story of history it feels really present and timely um and i know that patrick Redden keith also also wrote a book about the troubles yeah say nothing uh which is one that i know i need to read free by leo upi which is uh the subtitle is coming of age at the end of history and leo upi is from Albania, one of the most isolated countries on the earth, a place where communist ideals had officially replaced religion. Albania, the last Stalinist outpost in Europe, was almost impossible to visit and impossible to leave. Then in December 1990, a year after the fall of the Berlin Wall, everything changed. The statues of Stalin and Hoxha were toppled almost overnight. People could vote freely, wear what they liked, worship as they wished. There was no longer anything to fear from prying eyes, but factories shot, jobs disappeared, and thousands fled to Italy on crowded ships. As one generation's aspirations became another's disillusionment and her own family secrets were revealed Leah found herself questioning what freedom really meant uh, this is another one that I've heard a lot of people praising and so potentially would have picked up on my own entry anyway uh, and I've read fiction from Albania but never any non-fiction about the country and the final book on the shortlist is Islands of Abandonment Life in the Post-Human Landscape by Cal Flynn and this one is about conservation and was also shortlisted for the Wainwright Prize this year in Chernobyl following the nuclear disaster only a handful of people return to their dangerously irrad irradiated homes. On an uninhabited Scottish island, feral cattle live entirely wild. In Detroit, once America's fourth largest city, entire streets of houses are falling in on themselves. This book explores the extraordinary places where humans no longer live or survive in tiny precarious numbers to give us a possible glimpse of what happens when mankind's impact on nature is forced to stop. From Tanzanian mountains to the volcanic Caribbean, from forbidden areas of France to the mining regions of Scotland, Flynn brings together some of the most desolate, eerie, ravaged and polluted areas in the world and shows how, against all odds, they offer our best opportunities for environmental recovery. So those are the six books that I'm planning to read in this vlog. I will get back to you later with some of my thoughts and ideas and hopefully I will learn how to review non-fiction books. Okay, hopefully I will have fixed this in post, but something about this camera in this room is making me bright pink every time I turn on the camera and I'm not sure why that is um, but I probably need to sort that out. I've started reading Empire of Pain. I'm like 20% of the way through it and I am really enjoying it. It is like the chunkiest of all the books although I have the audiobook so it doesn't seem so chunky um, and I was worried this sort of journalistic look at the Sackler family was going to be beyond me to be perfectly honest um but it's not it's really really accessible and a really well told story so far um so we've we've gone back to the like founding of their companies um in the 20s 30s 40s 50s 60s kind of through from the childhood of these three brothers up until the 1960s i think is roughly where we are at now um and kind of the history behind why they're so private and um don't talk about like didn't want anyone to know where their money came from or who they really were wanted to have their name all over everything but didn't want anyone to know them Keith has done a really good job of creating these characters obviously they're real people but developing this main uh, guy arthur um sackler him as a person so that we see kind of the admirable qualities that he has and then he kind of brings in the darker sides to things um in a way that i think is really compelling and really makes sure to read a lot more um it's very there's a lot of facts in it a lot of like real information about the founding of this company and who everyone was but it's done in such a really easing you in way everyone's really well introduced so that i'm not confused by any of the names if you were feeling intimidated by the size of it or the content of it or anything i would say you don't need to be because it is really readable like obviously i'm listening to the audiobook um which tends to be easier anyway um but i think that even reading the physical book it would be an easy enough read um and like i said a really compelling one so yeah i'm gonna get back to that it is so cold today um it's like eight degrees but with a wind chill of like six so it feels like six degrees we haven't had a particularly cold autumn um it's been like in double digits the whole time so i was not prepared for how cold it is out there it's like going down to minus one tonight so yeah um glad to have my cup of tea but anyway i am now halfway through empire of pain and we're on to like the next generation of sacklers and 
he's really building an excellent story like obviously it's non-fiction but i think you still have to sort of build a story to make it compelling and it is so intriguing and interesting and i like the way he sort of captured us into this family by introducing us to like charismatic elements of people and then seeing how like dark they go and how that changes when it's passed on to their children because the oldest brothers of this generation grew up during the depression and their parents weren't particularly well off and they made all this money um and then and also experienced a lot of anti-semitism um and like his two of the brothers couldn't get into university because there were quotas against jews and things but the younger generation just obviously grew up with this fabulous wealth and with this like really secretive lying to each other stabbing stabbing each other in the back kind of feeling going on so there's a lot of like intrigue and they're very different people um and it's yeah it's really interesting not that the older generation were particularly um kind people either but it's just interesting to see how it changes over time um and we've got into like morphine opium uh section of it now and how much like scheming and lying and how that is not just in their business practices but in their medical practices as well um they seem like terrible people um but I am, it is really compelling, really well told. The One of the major problems I'm having with it, which is obviously actually quite a minor problem, um, is it's read by the author, who is American, and one of the wives of this man was from Glasgow. Um, he says she was British and from Glasgow. Glasgow. And I was like, where's Glasgow? Oh, he means Glasgow. And he's pronouncing it as Glasgow, as if it rhymes with how Americans say Moscow. Um, I mean, Glasgow does run with Moscow, so uh, maybe that's where it comes from, but I'm quite confused. I've literally never heard anyone uh, pronounce it as glass cow before, um, but that's definitely wrong and quite annoying, <laughs> but obviously very small point. Um, I think because I'm listening to it as a uh, audiobook, it is reminding me of like a long form um, journalistic podcast, so I guess that it's written in quite a journalistic way. I don't read a huge amount of like long form journalism. Or anything like that um so uh my experience of it is through an audio medium more often and more of a podcast person that's why my frame of reference is but yeah i'm really enjoying it i can't say much about like how factually accurate it is or anything like that because i'm it's I, i'm it's not a topic i know anything about and um so i can't really judge it on that matter i'm just gonna have to judge it on how much i enjoy it but yeah um i would say i am enjoying it so far hello so i have finished Empire of Pain by Patrick Radonicki and I thought that this was a really excellent book. Um, it starts off as kind of a biography of this family uh, and it goes into like a legal drama um, because we begin with kind of the setup of this, of this company, where the Sacklers got their money, why they were so interested in funding the arts etc and then we go on into the future where they start to make Oxycontin and also Valium and the ways that they marketed those drugs, the lies they told about those drugs and the way that those drugs ended up being abused and they tried to avoid any uh, blame for it falling on Purdue, which was the drug company, and Sackler, the family as well. Um, so yeah, I thought it was really well done, really interesting and engaging, very accessible for someone who does not have legal knowledge. I listened to the audiobook and I think that that made it a better reading experience for me. Um, I wonder if sometimes some of the laws or listings of how thing, much things are worth, if that would have really detracted from my enjoyment of the book. But yeah, for the most part, I really, really enjoyed this. Again, it also got a little repetitive um, towards the end, but I do, it's hard to judge that because it got repetitive, but that is part of the story. And part of the story is how they would go about repeating the same things in order to get out of things. Really, the audaciousness of people with money is unbelievable. And I mean, like, people with ridiculous money. The audaciousness and the difference between the older brothers who had grown up um, in a very different environment still were ruthless people, but the difference between them and then their children who just had zero connection with the real world, zero understanding that other people exist, um, it seemed like at times. And so, yeah, this was a really, really interesting read. And despite being so chunky, I blazed through the audiobook. Um, I don't know if I would have got through it as quickly had I read the physical book. And I could really imagine it being like a Netflix series. And I really liked the way that he revealed information to you. Like he would build up this 
picture for example of the Arthur the eldest son of the first lot of people um as this certain type of guy and then slowly revealed his ruthlessness and his less moral ways of behaving um from being like the american dream bootstraps hard work protestant work ethic despite being jewish but you know that kind of american protestant work ethic um myth ideal and then kind of just smashed that myth completely and i thought it was really really well done um so i yeah i liked the way that he w wove in interviews and things it felt like a well woven narrative uh, rather than disparate interviews like the way he collected the information I think was done really well so yeah I really really enjoyed this book I still working out how to review um non-fiction but hopefully that was uh enough to spark your interest hello so I have read the first the introduction and the first two chapters of Fall and I'm yeah I'm enjoying this one Robert Maxwell seems like a very interesting character it's quite funny there's quite a lot of comedy um brought about by the absurdity of Robert Maxwell as a character like he's someone who likes to have aliases and just make stuff up about his life all the time and so there's a lot of like ridiculousness woven into this uh but from a very difficult background um but he was Jewish in Czechoslovakia before the second world war and then he he joins the second world war when he's 16 uh the French foreign legion and then the British army eventually he lost pretty much his entire family in the holocaust um and so yeah that's he's come from a very difficult background but he escaped from that and didn't know any of that until the end of the war um so i've only just discovered that so it, the rest of his experience of the war is actually quite funny um because he didn't experience that he left before germany invaded czechoslovakia um and so his experience was quite different but yeah he seems like an entirely absurd person um so it's interesting we haven't yet got to the actual crux of the story because like the intro and the um synopsis describe it as being about like how he went from being this titan of industry to 10 months later dead in a river uh completely disgraced even though it is quite funny there is some darker sides to him too um some of the things that he did during the war are not really not cricket. I would say it's very readable as well. The same as the Empire of Pain, which is the only one I've other one I've read so far. Um, it's got that same readability and sort of intriguingness to it. None of these so far have been particularly dry, which is what I often worry about with nonfiction about a topic that I don't know anything about. That it could be quite dry. So yeah, I'm enjoying this one. I am now halfway through The Fall by John Preston, and I have mixed feelings about this book. So. I really struggle to pick it up and I'm really um, unsure whether I want to keep reading it every time I'm like oh I have to read that book again don't I but I really enjoy it whilst I'm reading it I think it's got a lot of humour in it um, and he's definitely a fascinating character Robert Maxwell um, so I think it's a, I can understand why a bi biography of him was uh, what John Preston chose to write he's such a like comedy character it's like satire the fact that he exists is so strange i just don't feel drawn to it and i'm unsure why that is um i think that the story itself doesn't really interest me what interests me is his fall and the scandal around it but we're way back in time about the build-up of his life um and i understand that because we are looking at like his political and uh, business dealings in the 1960s and we're seeing the way that he scams people over and over and over again and gets away with it just by being audacious and i thought it would be more of a tight focus on that time period and it's really not it's a biography of his full life and i don't know if i personally would have preferred a more tight focus but i am wondering if i had the audiobook if i prefer that because uh, like I said when I was reading Empire of Pain um, there are points when it's just listing values of stuff that I just don't care and that might go easier in audiobook and perhaps I just prefer audiobook for non-fiction who knows we'll have to see over the course of this vlog so I've just had my booster jab for Covid if I get a li little bit woozy or I start seeming a bit sick it's probably just a reaction to this booster jab um, but I didn't have any reactions to the first two so I have finished Fall by The Mystery of Robert Maxwell by John Preston and this book, I didn't love this book, um, I didn't really like this book very much. Um, like I said in some of the other clips it had humour and the kind of wild ridiculousness of Robert Maxwell's life was quite interesting. I definitely skim read some of this, um, some of the buying shares for this meant money and buying properties and mergers and acquisitions i really could not be asked for any of that i found it quite boring and overall yeah i just don't think there was that much to interest me about this however i will say that with 
non-fiction, it's a bit different, isn't it? Because I would never have picked this up. Biography of this Robert Maxwell, this sort of odd megalomaniac. It's not really my genre of non-fiction anyway. It's not really my vibe. Um, so that might be partially why I didn't like it. I think it's so difficult to judge these against each other because of that, because they are so different from one another. When I read The Booker Prize, those are all literary fiction novels. And when I read The Goodreads Choice Awards Historical Fiction, obviously those are all historical fiction. So they have some things in common. And also they're all novels anyway from, any, from there. So there is more to compare them. Whereas these, you have a biography and journalistic, long, long form journalism and um, climate change and history. So they're not in the same genre, they're just all fact-based. Um, so there is some difficulty with comparing them. But yeah, I would say that this, I would never have picked it up anyway. Um, it's not a thing that interests me. And I was proven right because I found this quite boring. There's not as much human interest as I felt there was in Empire of Pain, even though it is about people. It felt much more like stats heavy and less interesting. Um, I think that if it had focused in deeper on those last ends of his life, maybe it would have been more interesting if it had told that story. Um, but it felt a bit fleshy and unnecessary, a lot of this book. So it definitely wasn't my favourite. I have begun Islands of Abandonment by Cal Flynn. Um, this one is about places that have been abandoned, that people um, have left for one reason or another, and the way that nature reclaims things, including even things that you think nature couldn't reclaim, like slag heaps after shale gas, ex um, ex shale, is it shale gas, shale oil? Extraction in Scotland um, and the way that the slag heaps returned and the way that they were better when left completely alone than when humans tried to interfere to make them seem tidier um and yeah it's really interesting so far i'm really enjoying it it's very much like quite beautiful lyrical nature writing which i think is something that i like and something that i've definitely been intending to explore but it's also very much about conservation and about the ways that these things work i find it really interesting i'm not a science person um historically but i am fascinated by this the science in this book i found it really interesting and also some of the history so she talks about climate change and man-made climate change and how some people theorize that it might have actually started earlier than the industrial revolution and just the way that humans change the landscape with agriculture culture and stuff affects the climate too and the way that things like a lot of the forests in Germany date from the age of the Black Death because the death of people meant that far the death of so many people meant that farms were abandoned and they returned to forests um so yeah it's really interesting I'm definitely enjoying reading that uh, but I kept wanting to keep listening <laughs> I needed to check in um and I haven't been able to check in until now so yeah it's definitely one that I feel like I will breeze through. Um, I still think that in terms of narrative, it's not as strong as Empire of Pain, but that might not be what the point of this book is in the same way. So we'll have to see when I get further into the book. I am halfway through Islands of Abandonment now and I am enjoying it. Although I would say like Empire of Pain, it doesn't have that like narrative structure tying it together. Um, it has a theme and it's all about places where these abandonments have happened and talking about the, the reclamation of nature and the way that humans interfere with that. Um, but it doesn't have like, this is the beginning, this is the end or any sort of set like narrative structure. Um, and I think that that's making it a little easier for me to drift in and out of. Um, there's no sort of compelling pressure forwards. It is, however, the one that I'm most often stopping to tell my partner facts from, um, like the fact about their, how in the um, London Underground a new species of mosquitoes has developed that is so split off from the above ground mosquitoes that they can't interbreed anymore and it has become more, um, it prefers the taste of human blood whereas above ground mosquitoes prefer the taste of birds blood. Um, so yeah, it's really become dependent on humans and kind of blowing my mind about a lot of things like about man-made climate change. I think I talked about it in the last clip where I talked about it. So I'm definitely very interested, but I'm finding the pull to read through it less, drawing me in less than Empire of Pain. I am about 15-ish percent of the way through Aftermath, Life in the Fallout of the Third Reich. It, there was an introduction obviously and then we've gone right back to just after the war we are in 1945 looking at the rubble and the rubble art which is can you see that 
I prefer the style of writing of this than I did to Fall, for example. Um, I'm finding it more interesting to read about. It is, German history is not something I am hugely familiar with, particularly after the Second World War, so this is all new to me. Um, but I am, I am so far enjoying the writing style. It's, it's about, it's sort of a person, uh, a people's history. So there's a lot of quoting of people's diaries and letters and things um, that were referencing this time period. Um, and I think that that I find more interesting because it's talking about how Germany after the war was divided between the British, the French, the Americans, the Russians. So there's no like cohesive German story to tell. The Auschwitz trials didn't happen until 1963 so there's a turning a blind eye and seeing themselves as the victims after the end of the Second World War because obviously individual German citizens had been victims of severe bombing campaigns by the British and um, sexual violence from the Russians when they invaded Berlin. Um, so there are elements of that but also obviously a complicity bystander thing to the Holocaust um, and the Holocaust is kind of ignored at this point in history. So, so I am now halfway through Aftermath by Harold Yarner. Um, I'm struggling with this one a little bit too, as I did the fall. Um, and I'm wondering if that's, like I said earlier, I think that I struggle with um, nonfiction in physical form, if I much prefer my nonfiction in audiobook form, um, because I'm so used to podcasts and if that would be my preference, generally speaking. I definitely like this one more than The Fall. It's very interesting. Um, again, there's not a narrative through line in this one um, because it's just about the period, an overview of the period through different themes. Um, some of it's very hard to read about, about um, like this mass migration of people in Germany and the treatment of people who are moving from place to place, like all the Jewish people who'd been released from concentration camps when uh, they were liberated but weren't given anywhere to go and the continued anti-semitism afterwards particularly pogroms that happened in Poland afterwards and things like that and then also the treatment of women um, by the Red Army in Berlin but also um, by Americans and by their own people um, the German reaction to the Red Army violence against women was that the, the women were to blame um, which is of the time. Uh, so some of it's really more like light-hearted about the partying that happened and about like women wanting uh, early kind of feminism. I guess not, I mean there was probably like suffragette feminism in Germany pre-previously pre but I mean early second wave feminism I suppose. Um, but yeah I am enjoying it, I'm just finding it quite hard especially because I'm trying to finish it and I'm trying to read quite fast and I think if I'd been a bit quicker reading the others and had a bit more time to spend on this I would feel a bit less rushed. Do you think I prefer narrative non-fiction or essay collections? Um, that's my experience so far anyway, to a sort of more broad general overview. Um, but maybe it's just something I need to get used to if I want to read more non-fiction. We'll have to see. Hello! So um, I have finished Aftermath by Harold Giana. Sorry, you're in a really awkward position because I couldn't find my tripod. I cleared out my shelves yesterday, um, which you might have seen that video. I'll put it in the cards above. Um, that's why it's a bit of a state round here today. Anyway, I'm about to go off to work. But I finished Aftermath by Howard Jana. Um, very interesting um, in terms of what was going on, but I did find it hard to pay attention to. Um, I feel like this is very much a history book for people who like World War II history. Um, even though obviously this is post-World War II, it's still very much involved in the war and how the Germans reacted to the war. I don't know, I think I just struggle with like lists of facts and information, uh, which this did feel like it fell into sometimes. There were, there were some parts I was really focused on and really paying attention to and others that I was definitely just skim reading. And I don't know if that's like trying to read this fast, but I think the only thing that would have slowed me down reading this would be that I wouldn't have been that interested in picking it up. Um, and like I said earlier, I do think that interest in the topic makes such a big difference when it comes to nonfiction. Um, which is different to when it comes to fiction because even if the topic itself doesn't seem like it would interest me if the writing style, the characters, the ideas being discussed work for me then I can read a book that is about something that I don't care about but it can make me care like I, when I read Cathedral earlier this year which was a historical fiction about the building of a cathedral in Germany which doesn't seem like something that would interest me because of the characters, the style of writing, the things explored it did work for me. The discussions about women's rights and things I thought that was really interesting um, and the discussion of 
how people now view the history of this time um, and the like popular conception of history because that's a topic that I'm interested in anyway particularly when it comes to things like empire um, that part interested me so the parts that already interest me interested me and the parts that I already am not that drawn to didn't interest me as much like I'm not an art historian um, <laughs> that sort of thing didn't draw me in um, and economic history again like I yeah although interestingly enough one of the I looked up this guy um, because I thought yeah I can see kind of he seems like a centre-right kind of writer that's the vibe that I got from him anyway um, and the I looked up some of the papers that he'd worked for and he'd worked for a centrist one and a centre-right one um, but the centrist one that he worked for had been owned by Robert Maxwell uh, from Full which was I thought interesting the ways that some some of these kind of interacted with each other there's a lot of 20th century history going on in Empire of Pain Fall and this um, so there were some like crossovers and stuff but yeah I don't think I would read something like this again or any of his other works because the topics just don't interest me and that I found is very important. I have started Things I Have Withheld by Kay Miller. Um, I'm listening to the audiobook and I'm glad I am because um, Kay Miller's reading it himself and I enjoy that because you get you get the all of the tone that you want. Um, I think it particularly works with non-fiction and also because um, he's a poet, a performance poet, um, I think he's quite good at reading it. Started off with a letter to James Baldwin, was one of the first essays, which I think was really interesting because one of James Baldwin's most famous work, um, The Buyer Next Time, is a letter to his son. And I've read a lot of things that have been done in that style, um, like Tana Hesse Coates and um, David Chayandi and um, Nika Shukla. They've all written ones as letters to their child. This is different because Camille is writing to James Baldwin um, as a dead person but a writer that he admires and a thinker that he admires and I thought that that was really interesting. Um, I'm also his next essay was about race in Jamaica and the understanding of race in Jamaica and black and brown and white um, and how race because race is a construct it's not a universal construct being racialized black and being racialized white don't necessarily mean the same thing so racism is structured differently um, so yeah that was an interesting essay I'm, I'm enjoying it I like his writing he's clearly a poet he loves a bit of repetition um, I think he's doing that well and he's also clearly a storyteller like he wrote this essay about race in Jamaica through what I'm assuming are fictional characters telling a story of their lives I, and I think the fact that it is short form as essays is also something that appeals to me I'm not a huge non-fiction reader but I want to be um, which I think is what I've said before but yeah I'm still unsure entirely how to review these books. I feel like I've not got a good handle on how to review them. The writing of all of them has been fine. I would say The Fall was the least, or Fall, it's just Fall, was the least compellingly written, but it was still humorous and I don't know if that's because the topic was of the least interest to me out of all of the ones that I've read so far. I am halfway through uh, Things I Have Withheld by Kay Miller. He is such a wonderful writer and I'm really enjoying the different themes that he's taking on. The essays don't really link together in any way except that they're just talking about, they're very personal I would say most of these essays. He talks about his family uh, and his family history and people who hold secrets. I wrote down something that he wrote about that because I thought it was really interesting. He said that someone had written, I can't remember, family are just the stories that we tell and he thought that it was families are just the stories that we don't tell applied more to his family and yeah I just thought that was interesting coming from like a Catholic family background <laughs> repression and not telling them the stories is kind of a big thing but uh, yeah he talked about that he talked about uh gay boys in Jamaica and sex workers um and his own experience being uh gay Jamaican um and he also talked about carnival in Trinidad and uh Duppies ghosts um I can't remember what they were called Buck Buck is what they were called in Trinidad um and he was talking about the way that people conceptualise the Caribbean, this interaction he'd had with this man who said, um, oh, I didn't know you had dogs in Jamaica. And then, like, how do you have that talent coming from Jamaica, being a writer? It's, like, really startling stuff, but not startling for him. Engaging, and I like the style of his writing. So, yeah, I'm enjoying it. Um, still halfway to go, but I think that he his poetry, the way he really, he uses a lot of repetition, he uses really interesting word choice, um, and I'm glad that I'm listening to the audiobook. I think it really works. I was trying to not look rough in this video. Oftentimes when I'm filming vlogs, I am, um, I've been recently like just filming them when I just wake up or like when I am just out of the bath when I look really rough. And I've been trying not to do that, but I just got home from work. Um, 
I'm not actually as pink as I look in the viewfinder, but this camera in this room, I don't know what it is about the green walls, but the white balance is all off and I look bright red. Um, <laughs> regardless, I have helmet hair because I've just cycled home from work. So um, anyway, we should talk about the books. I finished Things I Have Withheld by Kay Miller and I really enjoyed it. Um, I think that it's hard for me to love a collection of essays as much as I can love a single story. Um, because things are disparate and not necessarily connected so there's not a same through line. I noticed this this year when I read um, How to Slowly Kill Yourself and Others in America by Kaisi Lehman and I didn't love it the same way that I had loved his memoir Heavy. I think that for me whilst I can love each individual essay and although there is a sort of overarching theme as there was in Things I Have Withheld, I loved the way he was talking about like Caribbean culture um, and so like it sort of there are parts where he's in Jamaica and Trinidad um, and then the final three essays are in um, Ethiopia and Ghana and Kenya um, and talking about like feeling wishing he had a sense of belonging there because he has African roots but he doesn't know where his African roots are from and he doesn't feel any connection to Ashanti or um, Yoruba or anything because he doesn't know where his family came from because of slavery obviously um, and he talks about the history of colonialism he's a very really good writer at just sling things down and also at painting characters all of the people he comes across in the book they come they are so vivid and so wonderful and I love the way he uses um dialogue I do wonder when he's telling stories of things that have happened like how close it is to what act they actually said or has he polished it up um to make it funnier because or wittier or more sparkly because I feel like they are so well done I did think it was really good really well done really thoughtful um but I do think I would have preferred a memoir or a longer piece of work, a longer meditation that brings in these themes, um, but has more of a story to it. I think that that's what I'm discovering is that I really like a narrative in my nonfiction. I know I've said that already, but I think when things feel like they're building towards an argument or towards a story, I find it easier for me to focus on than when things feel like they are disparate and disconnected. So I've started Free by Leah Upi, coming of age at the end of history. So we're in 1985 and she's a child right at the beginning of this in Albania um, and the leader of Albania has died. Um, so we're talking kind of about the fall of communism, what it was like growing up in a communist country. Albania in particular was like really closed off from the rest of the world and didn't, was not aligned with Russia anymore, various, or China or anything like that and was very like isolated. Um, and there is a lot of humour, like absurdist humour in this. Um, it's a very warm book so far um, and I think it's really well written. I'm enjoying the f listening to the audiobook of this one as well and I do think that the four I've listened to an audiobook I've enjoyed more than the two I've read but the two I've read are also the um, subjects that I'm least interested in so it's harder to know whether I would like them more if I listen to them in an audiobook but I do think that it seems to me like non-fiction for me works best in audiobook um, and this memoir is definitely working though I feel like if I read the physical version of this memoir I would like it as much um, because it is a much easier read um, because it is just one person's perspective so there's not this overview um, she's telling us what she thought what she feel, felt what she noticed the things that happened in her daily life she's not giving reams of stats and facts and information like I got in Fall and Aftermath which is the thing about non-fiction that I struggle with the thing that I find intimidating and the thing that I find my brain switches off when it happens I prefer there to be more of a narrative I think so that's why I liked Empire of Pain which is this story but it's very which is this big like overarching stuff about facts about the opioid crisis and things but it's all told from the perspective of the story of this one family with a narrative arc um, and the writing style is more narrative um, and I think that that's what I prefer I think that's what I'm discovering I prefer so I've only listened to like an hour and a half of the audiobook of free so there's still a lot to go but yeah it's very funny um, and absurdist which I think is the way that a lot of things that I have read anyway about living under dictatorships have been because it seems as if there is a lot of absurd absurdism in that kind of totalitarianism but I'm going to read some more and then I'll get back to you. Um, I've just realised that this vlog is going to go up after the results come out so you will see me reacting to the results as well at the very end. I am finished at Free by Leah Upi and I really love this one. Uh, this one has what I was talking about before, it has that story element, it's the story of her life but she does use that story to talk about communism and liberalism and Eastern European history and the freedoms that are denied in 
under Eastern European communism, but also the freedoms that are denied under liberalism, um, and the different types of freedoms and different understandings of justice and freedom the things that were lost when communism fell, as well as the things that were gained. I think she did a really good job of posing everything. And like I said earlier, I love the perspective of her as a child going through this. And obviously this is what really happened to her um, living in Albania in the 1980s and 90s. She was a child then. Um, and there's the first part, when I talked to you about the first part, while she, her parents were still obviously hiding something from her and you keep picking things up, like about who her great grandfather was and stuff like that. The regime falls and suddenly she gets told the secrets. She also includes like her diary entries from when she, when it was 1997 and she was living there and she was worried about school and this boy she likes, but also there is civil war raging, um, which yeah, was, I, I think is always quite powerful and quite powerfully and it worked very well in this setting. It was really well written as well, I felt really, it felt like it could have been a novel. It would have worked well as a novel. All of the characters have family. I was really drawn to them. I think sometimes when she stepped back a bit to talk about the ideas, it lost a little something for me, but I understand why she put it in. The broader perspective rather than just her family's perspective. But I really, I just thought that her parents were so funny and their relationships with each other were so funny. I loved her grandma. I thought she was wonderful. Um, and the way they talked to one another, it was really amusing. And I really enjoyed that aspect. Hard for me to find anything to detract from it, except for the fact that sometimes it wasn't as enjoyable or hitting quite as hard. But you know, that's, that's always going to happen that there's little bits of lulls. So uh, the winner of the Bally Gifford Prize is announced tonight at 20 past nine. I have set my alarm so I'm hopefully going to film my reaction um, because I've never been able to do that before. But let's think back about the ones I've read. I would put Fall at the bottom of the shortlist for me personally in terms of enjoyment. It was the subject I was least interested in anyway and also for me I think it would have been more interesting if it was really focused in on that last year and got more into the emotional details of the family and less into the stocks and shares aspect of it. I think that that could have been woven in in a different way um, and comparing it directly to P Empire of Pain both deal with these business aspects but one in a way that feels more integrated and talks more about personalities and one um, that just feels a little more dull. Then above that I would put Aftermath by Harold Jana and the reason for that is that some of there, these were lots of different sections, different themes of what was going on in between 1945 and 1955. Some of them I was more or less interested in. And again, it's just stats. I, I'm not a stats person and all the facts and figures lists of people. I just can't get on with that. Um, as I've said the whole way through, I need a narrative. And those two were the ones that missed narrative the most. The other four, I really liked all of them. Um, so it is a bit more difficult for me here into which order to put this. I think I would put Islands of Abandonment next because uh, it was so beautifully written. I really loved the nature writing of it. Um, but again, I think that some of the segments were better than others. Um, and then, but, and also because I forgot it. <laughs> that's why I'm putting it in here as well because it didn't stick in my head as much. But that's kind of unfair because um, Things I Have Withheld and Free, I have just finished today and the other and um islands of abandonment i finished ages ago so that they 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 might not have the same power but anyway then i think oh you know what no i can't do it i can't put them in order islands of abandonment empire of pain um free and things i have withheld are all really excellent books um i think and i think that they could all win i don't think i'd want either of the other two to win but those four i feel like they really could win um I think that as a piece of epic journalism, Empire of Pain is my favourite. It was so well done and so compelling. It's the chunkiest of these books, but the one that I felt like I could have got through the fastest because it is just so powerfully, this story is so compelling and so disgusting. Um, things he's unearthed, the, um, he really draws you in. In terms of what was my favourite, mine most in interested in, free potentially was what I was most interested in and it had the most warmth and it was the most novel like out of all of them um and I really enjoyed that aspect of it so Empire of Pain felt like epic really great journalism whereas um free felt like a story and a family that I really felt warmly involved with that also talked about communism and kind of when I'm reading my fiction 
that's what I like. I like the ideas and themes to come out through the characters and I thought that it did that in a non-fiction way so well. Islands of Ab Abandonment was pr probably the most beautifully written, the most lyrical and lovely, the most visual and evocative. Um, the cows on that island in Scotland, I keep thinking about them, the wild cows on that island in Scotland, um, and the thing that was making noise above her and she didn't know what it was. That was creepy. Um, and I, that's the one that I have spent the most time telling other people about facts that I learned from it. Things I have withheld was per perhaps the most moving, the most emotionally involving, and also up there with Islands of Abandonment for most beautifully written. Um, and the one that I would recommend most in audiobook. I would recommend Empire of Pain in audiobook because it is a chunky beast of a book um, and I feel like listening to it would be easier um, but for things I have withheld I recommend it in audiobook because Kay Miller reads it himself, Kai Miller, because Kai Miller reads it himself and he is a performance poet. You can feel it and the way that he brings everything to life. So yeah, all four of them <laughs> I liked and I find it hard to say which one I would say was the best. Empire of Pain. Empire of Pain was the most work. Empire of Pain, I would say probably, I mean, Islands of Abandonment, she did travel to those different islands, but you know, that's fun. So <laughs> I would say maybe Empire of Pain seems like it was the most intense. Normally I'm good at this. When I did the Women's Prize and the Booker Prize, I made a list, um, ranked them all. But um, for the Ballet Gifford Prize, I don't seem to be able to. So I'm just hoping it's not uh, fall or aftermath that wins. <laughs> Any of the other four I would be happy with. Maybe I will come back to you at the end of this month when I do my wrap up and see which one stuck with me for that whole time. It is the next day now. Um, I might have included a little clip of me trying to film this last night, but the Ballet Gifford Prize decided to announce their winner at half past at uh, 20 past nine and because my boyfriend's bedtime because my boyfriend leaves the house at 5 30 in the morning his bedtime is half past nine so um <laughs> which means that my bedtime is kind of half past nine as well so i had to give up on filming it last night um because they didn't announce it straight away like they do with the women's prize they wanted to jabber away first bally gifford prize right the bally gifford prize for non-fiction empire of pain Empire of Pain by Patrick Radden Keefe won. So that was one of the four that I said wanted to win. And actually, if you remember, uh, because you've just seen it, for me it was last night, I said that those four, um, Islands of Abandonment, Free, Empire of Pain, and Things I Have Withheld, I wouldn't have minded if any of them have won, but I thought that Empire of Pain would win because it same, seemed like the most work went into it. That's not like just internalized personal work. Like I was imagining him sitting there with like boxes of legal briefings and stuff like that. Um, um, it seemed a really intense work and a really good piece of incredibly long form journalism. So I am pleased that that one won and I also am going to count it as me having called it because it's the one that I thought would win even though uh, all four of those were equally my favourites because I found them so hard to compare to one another. Which means that last year I thought Hamlet would win the Women's Prize and it did. This year I wanted the Promise to win the Booker Prize and it did. And this year I th thought that pa Empire of Pain would win the Bailey Gifford Prize, Bailey Gifford Prize and it did. So that's three out of three for the first two years of my channel of guessing book prizes. Should I do more of this next year? Guessing book prizes, reading book prize shortlists. I've had a good time doing it. I still don't think I know how to review nonfiction, um, but I did enjoy the fact that I've read more nonfiction um, and I know a little bit more of my taste. Narrative nonfiction, not lists of stats and facts. Let me know in the comments if you think I should do more of these uh, and if you've read any of them. I'd love to hear what you think so we can have a discussion about them. Um, please remember to give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and to subscribe. I put out new videos twice a week so I will see you again very soon. Thank you for watching. Bye bye!